Alright, so this is something new for me, an instructional video for the song Triad by Tool. I attempted a drum cover of this song last year towards the end of March, and since posting it I have received a decent amount of questions and comments, primarily in regards to the first three minutes of the song. Um, I will preface by saying a couple of things. The first three minutes of Triad are very dense. There, um, there, there is a lot going on, but I firmly believe that if you, uh, if you take the time to examine the drum part and really do your best to analyze what each limb is doing independently of one another, I think you'll, you'll definitely notice that, that the drum part isn't quite as rough as it looks. Uh, the second thing I would just like to briefly say is that I'm not the most academic drummer, um, both in regards to how I play and how I discuss drums. So. Um, Please bear with me if any of my drum terminology uh, isn't quite up to par, or if just any of my musical terminology in general is more or less incorrect. I know what I want to say, I just sometimes struggle to say it, so I just want to at least make that clear. Uh, furthermore, in the video description below, I've attached three different images. These are drum transcriptions that I made um, for Triad. I think, though, it would be safer to call them unofficial transcriptions, being that I didn't make them an actual sheet music. I just simply notated what's being played when in a linear fashion in Triad. So um, I will have little annotations that'll pop up right over here as, um, as the video tutorial goes along. These are simply suggestions as far as when I think a good time to open these various transcriptions would be, uh, simply to help further along the learning process. So as this tutorial continues, I will explain the relevance of the first drum transcription posted below. The second transcription is basically a blueprint for Triad's main drum pattern during the first half of the song. Now, the third image posted below, that is, um, that's a lot more detailed. That actually contains four different drum transcriptions um, that, that I play in my cover of the song, and it basically is a reference to each of the four main different, you know, circular time patterns that take place as the um, as the first half of triad develops, and at the bottom right of of each of those four different transcriptions, I have the time in the video at which I perform those different those different patterns. So, um, you know, you can you can have that out to reference, um, you know, as you see fit. And I just wanted to uh, at least explain the differences between the three images that I posted below. Okay, so earlier I recorded some exercises on the drums. Um, these are brief exercises that I uh, do believe are crucial to learning triad in its entirety. Um, the, uh, they start small and they, uh, they definitely become more, more involved as, the, uh, as this video tutorial continues. And they're definitely, um, I, I believe, they're they're solid exercises for for helping develop, you know, the independence necessary to play the song. All right, so we might as well jump right in. The um, the rudiment that Danny Carey is playing during the first half of Triad is what I've come to know as a Swiss triplet. Um, I, I've seen it called a Swiss Army triplet. I think I've even seen other terms for it. Um, I suppose I'm not entirely sure what the actual correct term is, but for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to call it a Swiss triplet. So, it keeps things simple enough. Now, the Swiss triplet is, it's, um, it's quite simple. It's basically a series of two L's and two R's. But the, um, the neat thing about it is that the second L is played at the same time that the first R is played. And as a result, the rudiment takes up three spaces, or, you know, three notes. So there it is. That's the Swiss triplet. Um, as you can see, it's a very small rudiment. It's it's a neat little sticking pattern, but um, in in relation to how Danny applies 
this rudiment in triad, there are a couple of very important things that I would like to note before moving on. The first thing that I'd like to note of great importance is that Danny Carey does not flam the second of the three hits in his application of the Swiss triplets in triad. So when L2 and R1 meet, he keeps the flam very closed. I mean, he, uh, you know, f from what I've seen and heard of his live execution of the song, as well as what I can hear in the album version on Lateralis, his, um, his, his, um, his hits are incredibly tight when L2 and R1 meet. There is there is no flam. Um, as far as as far as I can see and hear, you know, I've um, I've watched the live video of him playing this song a lot. So I'm uh, at, at this point, I, I feel as though I'm pretty aware of the fact that he's not flaming those hits. And uh, as a result, in my cover, I did my best not to flam those hits as well. Now, the second thing that I'd like to note of even greater importance is how Danny begins the rudiment in triad. Um, Swiss triplets are usually written as L, L, R, R. And that clearly makes sense because that's what the rudiment is. But in, in the case of triad, um, when the repeating bass drum pattern starts, the, uh, the cyclical pattern of bum, 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 bum. When Danny plays that very first bass drum note, um, you know, when, when, when that first note is played, Danny is, is in the middle of the Swiss rudiment. He is playing L2 and therefore R1 at the same time that that very first bass drum note is played. Now, some of you may think, well, um, you know, well, why is that a, why is that a big deal? And, uh, you know, I, I can absolutely understand that question. But um, the reason why it, it is of great importance is because um, when you start to move your left hand from the snare drum to the other drums, as triads, um, as triads circular tom patterns progress, uh, y your transitions will feel very awkward and, and they'll, they'll just, they'll feel wrong. Uh, because if you don't initiate the rudiment the way Danny initiates the rudiment on L2 and R1, you'll notice that you're always one sixteenth note uh, behind as far as your transitions are concerned, especially, like I said, when your left hand starts to move away from the snare drum to the other toms. Now, furthermore, you might, you might, um, you might even say to me, well, hey, I see in your cover that you... Um, you begin the song by playing a series of left-handed hits. You initiate the song with only your left hand. And, um, you know, I'm seeing quite clearly that, you know, you're playing L1 and then L2 repeatedly. And that's entirely true. But if you notice, when I finally bring in the bass drum, L2 is played at the same time that the very first bass drum note is played. Now, for just for stylistic differences, I, I chose to bring in the right hand um, a couple measures after I had already played the repeating bass drum pattern, but rest assured that when the right hand comes in, um, it is playing R1, the left hand is playing L2, and that is happening at the same time that the first bass drum note is being played of the repeating bass drum pattern. I know that may have sounded a little wordy, but it's honestly the best way I can describe it. And keep in mind that um, when the left foot comes into play, um, both in Danny Carey's performance and in my cover, uh, that, that should help further solidify where everything is falling into place. So just, um, just, just, uh, just trust me that L2 and R1 initiate the rudiment in triad. Now, moving forward, I think it's very important to differentiate between the two main ways in which Swiss triplets can be perceived, so to speak, uh, to me at least. Now, granted, I'm, I'm quite confident there's, that there's probably an infinite number of ways in which they can be perceived. Um, you know, obviously, you know, given the context of how they're applied, you know, how they, you know, where they fall in a given piece of music, you know, it's this, I'm sure the, uh, the ways in which this rudiment can be heard are, are, are quite, you know, quite endless. But nonetheless, um, just for all practical purposes, just um, just for 
just to keep things simple and to help you know make a clear distinction between something that I think is crucial for learning triad, I want to at least make you aware of the two main ways in which these can be perceived to help clear up any confusion when you actually start to practice the song, okay? The first way that Swiss triplets can be perceived is what I would um, call the triplet feel. You know, go figure, they're Swiss triplets. Um, in this case, the downbeats contain three sixteenth notes. Um, there, there are three sixteenth notes that exist within each each downbeat or each quarter note. So I guess you could call those sixteenth note triplets. But um, just as an example, here's what they sound like in a very in a very basic sense. So as you can see, the um, the triplet feel is is pretty easy to understand, um, being that each of the downbeats contain three sixteenth notes. One full Swiss rudiment is able to fit within each downbeat, um, so that that's easy enough. But like I said just a second ago, this is not how they're perceived in triad. Triad has more of a four four feel, um, for lack of a more appropriate way to phrase it, um, and this. Um, Numerically speaking, this can make things um, slightly tricky. So, as you're aware at this point, the quarter notes in triad contain four sixteenth notes, and the Swiss triplet in and of itself contains only three sixteenth notes. So, when this rudiment is applied in triad, it takes a total of three full quarter notes for the Swiss rudiment to get back to its base position, where L2 and R1 are being played at the same time that the very first bass drum note of the repeating bass drum pattern is played. Now, for those of you who like to learn numerically, uh, the reason why it takes three full quarter notes for, uh, for the Swiss triplets to reach their beginning position um, where L2 and R1 are being played at the same time that the first bass drum hit of the repeating bass drum pattern is being played. Um, the reason why it takes three quarter notes is because the least common multiple of three and four is 12. And 12 sixteenth notes is the same thing as three quarter notes um, as far as as far as the way the um, as far as the way triad is set up. <laughs> And keep in mind the um, the first two um, transcription images posted below. Um, those would be beneficial to have open right now. The first one is differentiating between uh, the triplet feel and triads feel, and the second one, um, which, like I said, is essentially just a blueprint for how triads, um, how the drum pattern works in a basic sense throughout the whole first half of the song. Um, I put little numerals next to each of the X's, you know, the hi-hat chicks, um, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, I put those numerals next to those chicks so that way you could see um, where the L's and the R's are in relation to where you are in the pattern. And if you'll, you know, clearly notice um, at, at X1, um, you'll see that L2 and R1 are being played at that time. Now keep in mind, um, Swiss triplets don't have to be applied in this context where they're the main focal point of the drum part in question. Um, they um, uh, a lot of times, at least from what I've seen, you know, aside from triad, you know, the uh, the Swiss triplet uh, rudiment can be applied in in more um, in smaller, more more subtle ways, if you will. You know, a lot of times I, I've seen guys use it to. Um, to, not, not so much to fill per se, you know, in the in the way that most of us might think of a fill, you know, you know, a lot of times they'll use it as more of um, 
you know, more, more of a little textural thing, um, you know, in, in the midst of a groove. In my drum cover of Triad, I actually used the Swiss rudiment in this very fashion, where it, um, where it wasn't used you know, heavily on the toms. At uh, 3 minutes and 42 seconds in the video, I very briefly utilized Swiss triplets between the ride cymbal and the snare drum. Alright, so at this point in the lesson, I will move on to a series of further exercises which I recorded earlier. These exercises help to isolate the right hand as well as the left hand and they very much help to show each limb functioning independently as well as collectively. And finally, in the very last exercise, I will demonstrate to the best of my ability how Danny develops the song one limb at a time. Right hand, left hand, right foot, left foot. So there it is, that's the lesson. I sincerely hope that some of you have benefited from this instruction. Um, you know, Triad is an incredible song. It was, it, I, I don't know how many years ago now, but it was definitely the first song that, that really made me want to dedicate a lot of time to the drums. Um, so for those of you who enjoy the song as well, you know, I, I really hope that, you, that uh, you're able to take something away from this video. Um, Danny Carey, of course, you know, his, his creativity is, is 
really unbelievable to me and you know this song is no exception and uh, to this day I, I, I love the song just as much as I did when you know I first heard it you know a long time ago so like I said just um, you know do your best to isolate the limbs bring them together once you've developed the coordination you know and things will start falling into place and keep in mind it takes you know a lot of practice to um, you know develop the muscle memory um, to to play this song efficiently you know you know, any chance you get, you know, just 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 take some time to, you know, run some Swiss triplets, you know, really develop the, um, you know, the ability to play them, you know, without thinking about them, essentially, you know, for for you know close to three months leading up to uh, playing the cover that 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 I recorded, you know, I, I spent you know a lot of time just. <laughs> Just over and over and over again so and you know that, that that type of practice is good to really strengthen the muscles and and help you get to the point where you can you can execute you know the rudiment very easily and, and automatically and when you go to learn the song and the various circular patterns in the song um, you'll notice that that playing them will um, will, will come much easier to you um, with with that type of practice regimen so keep at it practice hard um, good luck and, you know, reference this tutorial as needed. And um, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess that's it.